good afternoon to all the participants today we will be discussing on the forest growing stock and carbon assessment using remote sensing and gis this is a very important aspect of uh, forestry uh, where remote sensing and gis is applied uh, not only in india it is now globally uh, the technologies have been used my presentation is uh, covering the definition and introduction and why what is the significant pardon, closer what is the significance of the uh, growing stock assessment and then how do we plan the uh, inventory of the stocks how do we use the remote sensing inputs that is the mapping part of it so i will be just briefly touching how to remote sensing can be an input for the growing stock assessment and most important part is the sampling design how do we go to the field and how many sample plots have to be taken what should be the size of the sample plots all that we will be discussing in the sampling design and the data which we collect from the field and needs to be organized in any spreadsheet it can be ms excel or it can be any uh, software statistical software where which you are familiar with that you can organize your database in that and then you can do the analysis uh, depending upon your requirement you can do the tree wise analysis you can do the plot wise analysis you can do the forest type wise analysis or age class or girth class there are many uh, possibilities to do the analysis uh, of the data and uh, one of the most important uh, objectives of the growing stock assessment is, is to know what is the yield yield means how much of the timber is available for harvesting because the government would like to have an assessment made how much of revenue will be generated maybe after 5 years 10 years 20 years or after 100 years so that kind of yield tables are there and we take the use of uh, make the use of the yield tables and try to predict uh, what will be the yield uh, we can also use the satellite data uh, where we have the pixel information which can relate to the uh, growing stock or volume or carbon available Uh, per pixel and then we can do the modeling and prepare a map which will show the uh, geospatial distribution of the uh, volume as well as growing stock as well as the carbon in the entire study area so let us start with the growing stock definition uh, growing stock is the sum that means by numbers or by volume whatever we we can say of all the trees growing in the forest or in a part of a forest at an specific time that means let us say in 2015 in a forest in let us say dehradun in the sal forest what is the total number of trees growing or what is the total number of the wood volume available in that area is called the growing stock that means it is in living uh, entity which is to be assessed uh, it is the above stump volume of the living trees that means uh, Uh, we we don't consider the volume of the tree for commercial purpose from the base of the tree it is little higher it can be 1 meter or 1 and 1/2 meter above the tree which is called a stump and we try to measure up to the tree top uh, it is the living tree component of the standing volume in terms of the quantity uh, in terms of the standing timber uh, that's called the growing stock it is also expects is expressed as uh, numerically for management planning and decision making uh, which is an important activity for all the forest department working plans management plans and the growing stock assessments the basic unit of uh, the gs is uh, it can be expressed either in the meters or in cubic feet or in cubic meters which is normally the precision now we normally go by the cubic meters let's try to understand what is the need for doing this kind of uh, study Uh, in forest sector growing stock assessment is an uh, important activity for the forest managers that for forest management particularly in the production forestry so let us say we have the conservation forestry where we try to protect the forest or wildlife or the biodiversity that's called products uh, conservation forestry but here it, we are talking about the production forestry that means we grow the trees for cutting in the future so that's called the production forestry and the information about the stock that is the timber available per unit area is the key information which is required for the forest inventory and for the uh, for the revenue generation to the government 
In earlier days, such information used to be collected by ground surveys. People used to go to uh, the uh, field and they used to map, make all the measurements, use the chain and and come and calculate and then try to assess the growing stock available there. However, with, now we have remote sensing in GIS. Let us we'll see how remote sensing in GIS can be used to facilitate the uh, growing stock assessment. Now, for regular assessment of growing stock or wood volume or harvestable timber available today or in the coming 50 or 100 years or the biomass available or the carbon which has been sequestered, these are very essential uh, points we should know or the country should know what is the potential for conservation as well as for the harvesting. Therefore, it is very important we should know what can be harvested, what can be conserved and how much we can conserve today and can be harvested in the future. So all these things are required for proper forest management, that's why we can say sustainable management of the forestry. Therefore, it is very important for the government of India to notify that how much of the carbon is available in our forest and which is done by NETCOM, which is a national communication by government of India, which is a commitment to UNFCC to provide the total uh, the carbon assessment which is available in the forest. Uh, the forestry sector, which is, uh, which uh, there are only uh, trees which can sequester the uh, carbon dioxide. Therefore, they are the, they convert almost 50% of the global greenhouse gases which are present, which can mitigate the global warming problem because uh, that can be sequestered and only plants can do that. And among plants, the trees are most important because they can hold the stored carbon or sequestered carbon for many, many years, maybe 100 years or 500 years or so. Therefore, the forests are more important. Nearly 30 million hectares, acres of tropical rainforest is destroyed every year, which is uh, very alarming. Thus, the global estimation accounts for almost 20% of the greenhouse gases emissions. That means it's about 5.8 billion tons of CO2 is released because of the forest cutting or deforestation. So that it means maximum contribution to greenhouse gases comes from a single sector that is the forestry. And if we can avoid cutting of the trees, this much of global warming, uh, the gases which are released can be minimized or at least can be curbed so that uh, we have less impact on our atmospheric CO2 levels. This is more than the global transport and the aviation combined together, if you put together which is released due to the fossil fuel burning and other sources. Therefore, the forestry sector is very important. And because of these concerns, the area under production forestry, that means plantation forestry, is increasing day by day, and it's around 2.2 million hectares per annum. And that's what this, the whole idea is that we should reduce our timber dependency on from the natural forest, so that we have the plant forest grown only for the uh, cutting and not the touching the uh, natural forests which are meant for biodiversity conservation and all that. These are some of the field photographs just to apprise you how the plantations and natural forests look like. If you look at the top left first photograph, this is the teak plantation about approximately 15-16 year old. You can see the rows of the trees planted and they are about equal height, equal girth or diameter. Uh, this is second photo is in the middle is the eucalyptus plantation. This is approximately six to seven years old. You can see it grows very fast. And uh, on the leftmost upper corner is the cedrus plantation, which is a very old, uh, which is thick. And you can see the when the canopy is, is so close that uh, it the the below the canopy it is almost very dark. Uh, among natural forests, I've just given some examples here. The Sal forest uh, in Dune Valley looks like something like this. And the Pinus uh, forest also similar something like in Dune Valley looks like this, which is the middle one. It's not a plantation, it's a forest. And if you go to the central India, you can see the dry deciduous or moist deciduous forest, which are a uh, density, canopy density is less, number of trees per unit area is also less. So the, the growing stock, basically what I, my idea is to tell you, the growing stock or the volume of the wood or timber available in different sectors in plantations as well as in the in the natural forest ecosystems they are different let's just try to understand why we should do uh, and what is the significance of the 
measurements which we will be making and to assess the growing stock. Uh, the, to start with, first is to determine the growth and yield of the forest. That means we want to assess the growing stock. Then to formulate the and to justify the forest measure, measurements. Sorry. Buying and selling of the timbers, revenue to the government, and to do search for research for the forest conservation and management, and to plan future forest and demand and supply requirement. That's very important. How much of the timber is available and how much imported or exported, and also we can uh, use this information for taxation purposes also. Uh, this is from the uh, management point of view, but from scientifically we would like to know what is the basal area. That means uh, the forest or trees which are growing, what is the basal area and what is the stand and what, what is the increment. That means annual growth in different forest types that we would like to know or different species in different forest types. What is the annual growth we would like to know because that will give me an idea how much will be produced in coming 20, 30 or 40 or 100 years. So that is a part of yield. We would also like to know the volume of the trees which are growing there, how much of trees there, how much of biomass is there, how much of carbon is available in the forest. That is a very important information which we need. And also we would like to know the logs which have been already cut, which have been harvested, how much of the volume is there. So we, because we are trying to sell that, we want to generate some revenue out of it. It is important for us to know uh, how much of volume of log or wood is available to us. And to make inventory of the growing stock and harvestable stocks, that means how much is growing, that is the availability, out of how, that how much can be harvested, that depends upon the forest type to type or the species to species and also the age. Some species can be harvested after 60 years, some can be harvested after 50 years, some can be even after 100 or 120 years. So there are different uh, recommendations or prescriptions for different types of species for harvesting it. Similarly, we would like to also be correlate because now we focus more on the non-destructive measurements or the assessments of the biomass, carbon and, and the growing stuff. We would like to correlate these measurable parameters such as height, volume, age, increment, etc with the diameter or girth which are easily measurable uh, from the field as well as now we have the high resolution satellite data or aerial photographs uh, which where you have the crown cover there which can be related with the, uh, with the bowl diameter and which can be remoted further with the remote sensing data and to create a GIS database which can be used for further modeling purpose. So that's a very important aspect uh, of uh, input comes from the remote sensing. Uh, for the stock taking in a given forest area, not only includes the measurements or the estimating, what is at present in certain moment is also uh, important and that includes that we need to focus on the forest plantations as well as natural forests. We also would like to do some prediction to determine the future productivity, the potential of the forest, that means how much uh, will be available and that depends upon the site quality. The site quality 1, 2 or 3, site quality 1 means you can have excellent rate of increment and you can get a lot of good uh, timber uh, at the shorter time. Similarly, for future harvestable timber, we would like to know what is the yield, what is the income and how much revenue I can expect after let us say 10, 20 or 100 years. So that way this is a very important aspect of it. We also would like to know what is the distribution pattern of the age and the girth class because uh, if you have all even aged uh, uh, trees that means uh, it has to be cut at one time and then again it has to be replanted. If you have a different type of the age class or girth class that means the mature trees can be harvested, the middle ones can be left for next time to be harvested or the young ones which are very new or which can be which will take 20 or 30 years can be harvested after that and regeneration, regeneration which is happening can be, if you can assess about the regeneration status then it can be harvested maybe after 50 or 60, maybe 70 years. That means different age class distribution of trees in a forest is a very important indicator of the health of the forest. If you have the, uh, all the stages or all the ages of the trees 
of different species represented in a different forest type that indicates that your forests are very healthy and you will have a very good yield out of this thing. However, in natural ecosystems, the assessment of for future forest structure is important, the succession, how it is going to progress, the yield and then ecological condition after harvesting. All these are very important because not only this timber is significant, we also should know what will be the ecological condition after the harvest, what are the changes likely to happen in the forest or the basic nature of or basic character of the forest. That is very important. We should not lose the basic character of the forest. It has been seen in many areas that uh, where evergreen forests have been harvested uh, without much of the planning, now they have got converted to dry deciduous forest. So conversion of moist or tropical evergreen forest into a dry deciduous forest is something which is not desirable to us. So therefore it is very important that we need to plan it properly. It can also give uh, the idea about the composition of the forest and it's the much timber. That means in fact uh, we should know how much of the uh, growing stock is available and that is what we would like to have. That is the basic objective of the forest management and to do the inventory and to get the information on these aspects. Therefore, in view of these, uh, the IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, would look, look like to have some requirements from each country, like what is the carbon stock available? What is the potential carbon sequestration in different forest types or site conditions? Because the potential depends upon the site condition. Any forest in the rocky areas will have less any forest in the deep soil will have more potential for carbon sequestration. So site conditions are very important. And the whole idea is to get uh, the, the potential and then to how to mitigate the climate change and to reduce the impact of the greenhouse gases which have been released or which are being released uh, day to day by different kind of. Let us come to the main aspect of the growing stock assessment. So we will start with the planning. How do we start uh, uh, to prepare for, to go for the inventorization? So let us say first, uh, I have put them in the, in the order. So first is objective. So we need to decide what information is required because a lot of information may be already available in your record. So only we should look for that information which has to be collected afresh or the old maps which are growing stock maps or uh, carbon maps, whatever they are available they need to be updated. So updated, so first thing is the objective has to be very clear. Second thing is how much time, funds and manpower is available. And then uh, the field conditions. In many areas, it is very challenging to go to the field and particularly in the remote areas of Himalayas, it's very difficult the inventorization of the forest because it might take days to reach the site and might to camp in the very inhospitable conditions to collect the data. Similarly, the area, the ownership, is it the private ownership or the public ownership or the government, this is very important to know. And compilation of data, information, past surveys, reports and maps and recommendation, we should know and we should get updated about that so that we know what are the gaps in the information so that next time when we go we should try to fill up these gaps. Then comes the standardization in planning and forest inventory for specific needs, tables and recommendations are required because uh, depending upon the objective, we need to design that. Then we need to have a team and the team has to be given certain responsibility and it has to be assigned to each member of it. Uh, then comes the forest classification scheme because uh, we are going to talk about the uh, stratification. So remote sensing comes into picture here and forest cover type map and forest cover density maps are very important inputs for uh, forest classification scheme and then for the homogeneity map I will be dealing little later. Then use of aerial space data for maybe very high resolution data possibly if you can get aerial that's fine but uh, very high resolution data maybe Iconos or Cartosat uh, or maybe still higher resolution data are now available so that's not a big issue. Next important thing is the how to have the sampling strategy, that is the sampling design for inventory. This is more important aspect of it because it depends upon the money, time and the manpower available. And what it should be the scale for the maps that are going to be generated, maybe 1 is to 50,000 or maybe higher. 1 is to 50,000 is good for the state level and all that. 
maybe one is to five thousand or maybe ten thousand would be good for depart at the uh, range level or maybe still uh, maybe village level one is to two thousand will be good enough for that. Therefore, we need to standardize the methodology for field data measurements, which is very important because if you divide the team into several groups, each uh, person has to follow uh, the procedure, same procedure, so that uh, they should not uh, collect information in different different procedures or following different uh, methods. So we need to develop a performer. We need to define the procedures. We need to have the instruments for that, and then we need to talk about the accuracy. and the precautions which have to be taken during the uh, measurements like we either can decide we take all the measures in centimeters or me me meters or we can think about the feet depending upon the requirement we can decide on that we should also decide on what kind of parameters we are going to observe in the field it can be dbh dbh is basically diameter at breast height uh, i will be discussing about this also uh, little later then height has to be measured for all the trees crown diameter is a very important aspect for correlating with the satellite data is then density of the forest is important or density of the common dominant species can be one of the uh, you know uh, criteria for taking the observations what are the form factors that some are tapering some are very cylindrical some are very broad there are different form factors for different uh, species and if we do not have the volume equation and available and we need to generate the volume equation then form factor is very important uh, which we need to do it in the field and we should also find out the uh, site conditions like rock outcrop stoniness or site conditions etc when we are in the field and then of course uh, the we try to correlate that these are the parameters like biophysical parameters which have to be related with the existing or developed Uh, equations already like dbh versus volume height versus dbh crown versus diameter of breast height or leaf area index versus volume similarly then we should talk about the budgeting and then we should talk about the capacity building which is done at indian stock remote sensing which uh, we can for you how to do the inventorization of the uh, then comes the logistics which we require in the field like accessibility and the operability in some terrains we it's very difficult to go we should work on that then we need to create database so that we have the spreadsheet created for automation and all other purposes and we should calculate the uh, errors like rmsc the probability or the sensitivity all these things have to be dealt before we or we have to fix before we start doing the field work similarly we should have the distribution class for tree height timber volume and class interval so what class interval we are going to follow normally we say less than 30 30 to 60 60 to 90 any classification class interval scheme can be followed but it needs to be defined it is better to follow the old scheme so that we can compare the earlier observations with the present observations so for uh, since we are making the plot observations we need to scale these to a larger area for that uh, satellite data is available so we need to upscale and do modeling for extrapolation or interpolation of different uh, data sets gis domain once the database is done interpolation is done we can then try to find out the biomass or growing stock or carbon beat wise compartment wise range wise division wise so that we can make type timbers available uh, for each beat for each compartment that's how they we can organize the database that will be very useful for the management then we can also do the growth and uh, draining that means what is the increment and how much of the full wood or illegal cutting or pest and cyclones uh, because of these uh, uh, trees have been destroyed or they have been uprooted so we can account for that also so for that also we should have a provision in the format uh, to note down things in the field itself uh, then unit wise harvestable timber available that, that means if you want to sell how much uh, what is the marketability of the uh, timber we should also work on that and then availability in future that is means after 10 20 or 30 years how much of timber will be available we should work and how to remove the transport uh, the timber from the field that means transportation we may cut cutting is not that difficult but how to transport the logs from middle of the forest to the road side for that you can use gis you can do the least cost distance analysis and then you design a route which is a least destructive and uh, at minimum cost you can get the logs on the road 
and then of course you can design what will be the ecological observations and future of the forest uh, that you can also think about it because that is very important uh, for us uh, if I have to know what and manage the forest in most best way. So in summary, let us say what are the things we need immediately to do. First is uh, let us decide what information is required. First then decide on the availability of the time and funds. Then what kind of classification scheme is required for stratification, forest inventory and sampling design, use of the aerial photographs or satellite data, whatever it may be, we can decide on that. And then existing information like maps, forest cover type and density maps from different agencies which are readily available to us can be also used. And then what kind of field instruments are required and we need to procure and the procedures have to be followed and then start the inventory and the, of the data and do the data analysis and then compilation. This is the flow chart which just says what are the broad steps for the uh, growing stock as well as the carbon assessment uh, using satellite data. So we have let us say start from the top we have satellite data here. Uh, we try to do the mapping that is the sampling design. We have the forest cover type forest density, we can use NTVI, we can use the accessibility that means we can have a road network, we can have a district boundary. This is a GIS database, these are the parameters which I am indicating here and then these will help me to identify the sample sites. That means I am going to use these uh, parameters for my homogeneity map in GIS domain. Uh, we overlay these layers and different uh, cross sections, each unit or stratum is a homogeneous which is good or ideal for sampling. And then in each plot, we will be laying the plot that it can be super plot, it can be say an ordinary plot. And you can also decide upon whether you are going for clustered sampling or you want to lay only one plot, depends upon your requirement, you can lay the plots. And then we have the database in must MS Excel file. And then we use the volume equations or these the volume equations for, are available in the literature and they are for, for different species, the different volume equations are available, they are very site specific, species specific, region specific and that we can use to get the volume, we can get the basal area and from the volume we can get the growth stock and if you multiply the growing stock on the, or the volume you get the, with the specific rate you get the biomass and, and if you multiply by 0.47 the biomass which is available, you get the carbon available there. So any of these methods, if either from the growing stock you can assess the carbon or you can convert it, the growing stock or volume into biomass and then you can get the carbon. Any of these methods which are, which are, or which are your, you are uh, familiar, you are confident you can do. So let us come with the forest classification scheme. These are, I will not go into detail of it. So what I am saying say that two things are very important. First is the season of the satellite data which you are going to uh, that should be very nicely chosen. Is this a resolution? Let us say, let us say medium or high resolution data is will be good and spectral resolution preferably multi-spectral or hyperspectral data will be much better. We do the as usual pre-processing of the data, we do the enhancement and then we go to the field and do the recognition survey and we have the ground truth collected and come back to the field, we do the visual interpretation or digital interpretation. So we have the vegetation cover type map, vegetation density map available to us and these the database is available to me in GIS domain. Okay, let us say this is an example here in Dune Valley. So these are the types of the land uses and land cover which we need to interpret and then we will have the this kind of a classified map which can be used for further any kind of, so I have like here you have a SAL, SAL plus Rohini or Lantana camera or Saijijim Kemenai, so different forest types different tree species or different communities can be identified on satellite data and then uh, this map can be used for further stratification. Next once we have the classified map then next challenge is to have the sampling design decided. So we have basically three methods one is the systematic sampling then the random sampling or the stratified random sampling any of these uh, uh, sampling methods can be used because uh, it is just impossible to uh, do the inventory of all the entire population. So the best thing is that we do only the uh, sampling for the very small area and that's why uh, we are doing the plot sampling. Sampling size can be area based or statistical depending upon the what the area is to be it can be percentage 
maybe I I want to have 0.001%, 2.05%, depending upon the time, money, and all that available, we need to do that. There is possibility to do that statistically also. If we know the variance, covariance, and we know the confidence level, it is possible to find out statistically how many sample plots we need to lay down in the field. So any of these methods can be used, whichever is suitable to you. Uh, if you if you have some information already available in your, from your area, then statistical method is better because you can use the variance and covariance which is already available to you to decide on the number of sample plots. So that will be more scientifically accurate actually. Then uh, uh, for sampling design, this depends upon the factors like uh, the objective of the inventory, the time and the money available to us, and availability of the persons for to handle, and then the instruments which are available to, uh, to me, availability of the satellite images, and then availability of the automatic processing equipment, whatever you have. And then the results which are there from the earlier, we can use that also. Uh, we can also use different methods like in random or in systematic, we have two methods for doing. So we can use any of these methods for laying the sample plots. So in random, we can lay anywhere in the stratum. In systematic, we follow certain systematic grid formation. And I will show you how to, can, we can do. Uh, each one has its own merit and demerits. Like uh, traditionally, uh, first department does the systematic sampling. It can be uh, grids can be created on a uh, satellite data FCC or on a screen or on a topo sheet, uh, and you can have maybe one kilometer by one kilometer or two kilometer two or by one degree by one degree or two and a half degree by two and a half degree, and the center point of that can be the you know, sampling site. So depending upon the objective, time available, and feasibility, one can choose the uh, type of the sampling has to be carried out. For sampling, so in the stratified random sampling, this has advantage because uh, we have already have a map now which is for its type map, for its density map, and we can use like physiography map, we can use even other site conditions map, we can overlay this and use the and or op operation and so that you have intersections and each unit will be divided into subunits which will be very homogeneous in nature. So this map which will be created out of laying these three layers becomes a homogeneity map and these sites are very homogeneous by age, homogeneous by type and homogeneous by class. And then if you lay sample plot there in each of the homogeneous then it is much better and you can get a very good satellite data which can be used for stratification and you can do for the uh, sampling design also. So this is Dune Valley. I'm just giving an example of it. Uh, this is a Dune Valley. Let us say this is an FCC. We will prepare a vegetation type map quickly. So let us say this is a vegetation type map. Uh, then over that I will prepare a grid. Let us say I have a grid here. It can be anything. It can be one kilometer by one kilometer or two kilometer by two kilometer or maybe one degree by one degree or two and a half degree by two and a half degree. Anything you can decide depends upon the uh, as I said earlier, man and man, manpower, money, and the time available to you, and then we overlay this on the set, uh, the classified map. The grid is overlaid here, and then if you look at this on the left side, this is systematic sampling. That means at each grid, at the cross section of, I will lay a plot. That means if I take in each grid, if I do the sampling, I need to take a lot of sample, maybe 80 sample plots for a very small area here. Or I can do in every second grid. On the left side, if you look, there is every second I take here and then I take here and then I take here. That means either in every grid or in every second grid I can take data. Another possibility is that I can take in every third grid. Ignore two, I, I can take every third grid. So what is happening in systematic sampling, like this area, most of this yellow area is agriculture. We are not supposed, because we are doing forest inventory, we are not supposed to do the sampling in the agriculture area. But as per our design, the area is, so many sample plots are falling in the agriculture areas. Many of times the point uh, falls in the middle of the riverbed. That also is not good. So therefore it is important that we have, so every third grade we need these many sample plots to be laid in that area. And then what happens? Suppose I have third grade, I can have again, any randomization within a 
systematic grid i can do some randomization that means i have the grid in each quarter any one of these quarters i can lay plot same left side as well as on the right side i can further subdivide this area into and lay the sample plots in each one actually so any of these methods i can use it i can also do the cluster sampling that means i instead of taking one plot i do the systematic sampling first and within the systematic unit i can do the cluster sampling that means i take four plots in each one which will cover up the entire variability microclimatic variability of the area and that will give me a better so this is left side also same example on the right side also so many clusters and this means four plots can be taken in a one of the sub units any of the methods you can follow another method is the stratified random sampling if you can see here all these this is a vegetation cover type map on that i may decide okay these are the locations i i can take my so this is very random i don't have to take any plot in the agriculture area which is down below in yellow in color i will only focus in the forest areas and that's how my time i can save on time i can save on money money i can save on manpower instead of wasting my time in laying sample plots or going there and then finding that is in agriculture area and that can also be avoided so depending upon that i can uh, do the this is example is for single uh, plot at one site we can have the multiple that's called the cluster sampling so instead of laying one plot at one site i can have four plots at one site this will give me lot of variability all that different minor vari variations in the uh, in the topography because of that which is uh, uh, there are maybe some species variation or density variation in the forest that we can all take care of so cluster sampling is supposed to be better than so we can take four plots here this is just an example of a case study you can see this is the sal forest here and then we this is sal forest here and type map and density map and then we can cross over here so i can get a sal with more than 80% density sal with less than 80% density all these kind of uh, classes can be created or generated rather uh, using gis so that you have the best uh, possible uh, options available for when you are doing the inventory and then you can this is on the left side you can see this is a, a software called the semi expert system which called forest cover density mapper which is an automated system where you can have the thermal band land set tm has the thermal band you can use the thermal band data to get uh, automated 10 classes like here on the left side you can see on the lesion 10 to 20 or 20 to 30 10 classes of density can be created automatically but you need to have some ground information and once you have this kind of information you can integrate the density information with the type map and then you can get a, a further homogeneous map you can now look at the different density this is uh, more than 80% very forest this is 60 to 80% this is 40 to 60% this is 20 to 40% and this is less than 20% so, so this is more or less open scrub uh, with few trees here this is scattered trees here so all these forest will have different kinds of stock like more than 80% will have the high stocking this will have a little less and this will have the last one Uh, less than 20 will have very less growing stock available to me there so this is uh, uh, the use, i can use it and then i have the sample site this is shows that these are the dots which you can see here these are the locations which i have uh, which we have done it based on the stratified element random sampling and to make the observations so once we that was the sampling uh, size this determination Uh, we can also use this statistical parameter there is called formula by chapo which is says the number of sample plots n is the t square that is the t test value into cv that is the covariance square of that and the divided by the percentage error which you are allowing so any of these methods you can use uh, this method this is a statistical method uh, for that we need to the field and do some representative sampling find out what is the covariance of the growing stock volume or biomass or carbon in that area so based on that cv covariance we will be able to find out the optimum number of the samples to be laid in that area or we can do area dependent that means i can decide that this percentage of area total area i am going to sample like i can say 0.002 2 or 0.005% of the total forest area has to sample and if we know this much area has to be sampled then we can sub how many plots have to be taken of some size it can be appropriate size maybe 20 meter by 20 meter or 0.1 hectare by 0.1 hectare 
depending upon that you can decide uh, okay this is the plot size uh, how to decide that what the earlier was the sample size that means number of sample plots and this is sample plot size that means what should be the plot size should it be 0.1 hectare like for forest plantations we need 10 by 10 or 20 by 20 meters good enough but if your forests are very diverse then we need a little bigger sample plot so that it covers all the biodiversity for that we do the species area curve and if you have the species area curve then it is always better to do at each site so if you can do the species area curve at each site then in each forest and you can account for all the microclimatic variability and you can do it in two seasons then you can get expect the best data which is can be collected from the field so what we do for this plot size determination we lay plot of 5 meter by 5 meter count the number of species then by 10 by 10 count the number of species we keep on increasing this plot size and keep on counting the number of species the best way is to do that uh, to mark all these points which are there on the topo sheet or the for or if you have an fcc printout you can mark it or if you have a and you can note down and you can feed in gps anything you can do it and then go to the plot where you want to do so that is the starting point is that you should face to the north and you can use any compass or anything and you can use tape for that and lay some plots of the size uh, whichever you have fixed maybe 0.1 hectare that is 31.62 meter by 31.62 meter or 20 by 20 meters in plantations if you taken at 1.37 meter that's called the dbh uh, in any direction i will tell you what are those places and then take the crown and from four direction and use the metallic tape for measurements so these are four three four possibilities this is the square plot you can lay out you can do the point plot which is a circular in nature or you take the transect along the gradient so you can anything you can follow depending upon your uh, requirement upon the money available any of these methods can be applied for that this is the super plot concept here the cluster samples you can have a two, within 250 meter meter 250 meter area you can take four sample plots of 0.1 hectare and then within the this is the subset of that within that you can have for shrubs uh, if you want to do accounting for that also you can for that uh, measurements as well also now next comes once we have laid the sample plots we need to do the measurements of the it can be dbh or the gbh any one of them so normally we uh, for dbh we need caliper and for gbh we need a simple ordinary tape uh, maybe metallic tape which can give you the the girth of this uh, why we need to take because the gbh and dbh and the crown and the tree height and the volume these have a causal relationship that means you can correlate if you know the dbh you can find out the volume if you know the height you can find out the volume or if you know the height you can find out the dbh any one of these you can find out if you know one thing so that's why measurements of these things is very easily done and without any destruction in the forest ecosystem so we are not looking to destroy anything so now the question comes why at 1.37 meters because that is the standard height which has been found where uh, the trees become more or less uh, cylindrical the all uh, buttresses and all that or the branching pattern and all that is avoided so that the ideal height which uh, is recommended for taking sample plots so you can see here this example on the left side this is a tree and you have buttresses here so if you can't take it so when it becomes more or less uniform cylindrical uniform we take the height that's 1.3 centimeter 37 meter this is a conifer we can take the measurements like this and you can see in this picture this is from the base it is 1.37 meter and this is the tape which is put here and you can find out what is the gbh of that so like let us see this step this is first step find out the height from the ground mark this you are marked with the pencil or whatever you have the chalk or something and then you can lay um, uh, this uh, put the tape here and you can exactly find out what is the a gbh in that so these are the steps how to make the observations in the field uh, there are different conditions are there so depending upon your uh, experience you'll be able to handle these things but in buttresses uh, if the buttresses are very high then of course where the cylindrical shape comes that height will be your dbh it, it may be more than 1.37 meters depending upon that suppose you have a deformity at the 1.37 meter then you should take above that or below that it is better to take above that dbh so that uh, uh, it becomes uh, more uh, useful for uh, for selling purpose 
if you have a branching below 1.37 meter if the tree becomes two before uh, below 1.3 cm then each branch is to be treated two trees so this has to be remembered in the mind sometimes you may have the branching takes place after 1.3 cm that is normal condition we don't have to worry about it actually and if if a tree is dead or one half of it is dead or half of it is living we will have to decide what is to be done mostly we take only that branch and uh, we need to because we are going to make uh, observations in the future because we are going to find out the yield we are going to find out the uh, productivity of that ecosystem mean annual increment it is better to do the uh, put these steps, metal tags at tree so that next time when i come i will measure this tree so the permanent sample plots have to be laid each tree has to be marked this is just an example where you can fix a metallic tree uh, metallic uh, uh, coin here which is number accuracy is written i e i r s number 1 and it could sometimes in 2009 or 2008 so that kind of uh, uh, marking can be done which you can use it later on anybody we may not be there but somebody else can find out okay this is tree number 1 and 2014 the diameter was this much and 2020 diameter is this one so for comparison for increment for monitoring this is the best scheme which can be uh, depending upon the requirement we will be using the height like uh, we can use the total height we can use the merchantable height which is uh, with uh, the bowl which can be sold in the market from where you can get the income or you can uh, measure the total commercial height depending upon your requirement you can do all that so that's uh, depending upon the feasibility uh, you have to do it so here i am giving some examples here like this is a tree so this is the total height here so from the base to 20 cm girth that much you can take it so there are different examples i have shown here in different conditions you can uh, try to take observations these are some of the field photographs taking the uh, this is using a hectometer this is using a dendrometer you can take the uh, tree height of this thing these are the instrument this is called the left side is called hypsometer which is a manually operated is very good instrument very stable and works in all conditions this is the same thing is zoomed in you have the different markings here for different distances and this is dendrometer which is a digital which can given a height accuracy of in centimeter accuracy so this is also very useful and there are some precautions have to be taken when you are making this kind of measurement uh, there could be three four kind of conditions in the field suppose uh, in let us start with this in, in the mid, lower mid, middle diagram here if you are in nearly flat area here and if you are using hypsometer so this is the angle which you are getting this is the tan theta angle and and you can see the base so this height plus your height so that you can you measure your eye height plus this height you add up you get the tree height if you are standing on the on the hill side upper side so what there you are measuring this part and this part is left out so this plus this that is the bottom height so first i will click once here then i will click at the bottom see so these two things i will add up i will get the total tree height in many cases i will be stay, staying or standing on the below the tree on the slope side in the valley then i will be overestimating the height so what i will do i will take the can kind of total tree height and then focus upon on the base of it so total minus base i will be getting so i can subtract it i will get the tree height sometimes you get tilted trees also so you can use the pythagoras theory here you can try to get the tree height so there are different possibilities in the field which is to get the this so these are the precautions which i have already given you something that we need to clean the bowl we need to uh, take the uh, keep the horizontal the face the horizontal the bark if it is with thick bark if the dead cork is there the cork has to be removed all these precautions uh, uh, can be very useful for the future assessments here let us see now we have the measurements then next important thing is to estimate the volume that is the wood volume of table that's what the main objective is and therefore we need to choose the volume equations for different species volume equations have been generated by forest department and forest survey of india and the forest research institute as well as the research institutions or universities we had to search the literature but many of the things are compiled in the report which has been published by the forest survey of india you can get it so best of possibility that if i can get a species area species specific and area species should be my first choice 
but I can get this thing. So I will have several options. I can have a region specific by uh, volume equation. I can have a state specific or general equation. Any of these equations I can try to use these ones. These are some of the examples uh, which can be there. So if you do not have any of the uh, volume equation, then quarter girth formula. This equation is here. So you have girth and then you have the uh, length of it. So the quarter girth formula is also good enough to find out the volume of the uh, each tree. Because once we know the volume, then it is for me, I can find out uh, a very simple linear equation like this one. You can use it to generate a, a volume equation or can get the volume. This is just an example where I can have the like this is for sal, this is for T, these are the volume equations like this is for UP, this is for Maharashtra, like this is for Rajasthan, for different state, for different species, for different site conditions, there are different volume equations. So this is a very rigorous task to find out a suitable volume equation so that you get an accurate volume estimated based on the observation. So this for this we have to do like some survey and also do, do some kind of analysis. Uh, then you can do the, this kind of a graph, a graph you can generate because this shows that as the forest grows older, the number of the thick tree decreases, thin trees will be more. So this is a reverse OGI curve here, which you can do. So this is next graph probably will give you more. So this is a basal area versus volume. You get this kind of a curve. This, if there were some haphazard readings here and there, that means those are the errors. So I can do this uh, error checking also here. And once this is done, then I am ready for the yield. And then for that, uh, I have the volume estimated. So I have volume of time one, I have volume of time of volume time three. I can find out what is the increment. And therefore I need, if it is a even age forest, let us say in plantations, if I have been measuring this every year, let us say five, six year, or 20 years or 30 years or maybe more than that, I know what is the annual increment and what is the site condition. For each site condition, for each, I know the increment so I can find out the what will be the total yield after, let us say, 30 or uh, 40 years or 100 years. So that uh, four types of the yield, the final yield basically at the harvesting time, what is the I am going, going to get. Then financially yield that is in terms of money, how much money I am going to get depends upon the rates at the market rate. And then we can get intermediate because of the lot of operations also keep on going in between like thinning. Uh, we keep on thinning, the poles are removed so that the, you get um, give more chance to trees to uh, grow uh, in the girth and grow in the height. So thinning is done. So that is also a midterm yield. And then we have total yield which is basically final including all the thinning and all that you can uh, get the total yield for that matter. So uh, most of the areas you will find in yield table. Yield tables are basically, they help us to find out the total. Once I have the database on the dig and all, once I know the, uh, today what is the volume available, I can predict for the future. So that is the use of the uh, table, depending upon the site quality, you can relate to the productivity, the growing stock, you can relate, you can determine the increment, that is means, uh, uh, the current annual increment as well as the mean annual increment, any of these things you, you can find. These all information are given in the, uh, the uh, tables which uh, will be very useful. However, there will be some limitations in that because uh, uh, they may not be uh, very accurately done many times. So you have to do that and because I said earlier also these are mostly plantations. So for natural forest you may have some problems. So depending upon the age this has to be considered and the age is a very important factor for, uh, for calculating the, the growing stock in that area. There are different kinds of factors which affect the yield. Uh, I will be just touching upon here and there like one is the crop and average diameter is very important. The structure of the forest, growing aspects, what are the different aspects of the growth and growing conditions available to there, what is the density of the forest, what is the productive capacity of the forest that site or what we call it site quality and these are the essentially factors which affect the uh, site uh, which are affecting the growth of the uh, plants and then of course the yield of it. Then it will depend upon the many factors, many factors which is the size, class, distribution and also the locality factors. Uh, this is the stand age, this is a very important aspect of it because if you have a proper regeneration that means you have a, uh, very young, middle-aged, little older, very old, all age class if you have, then it is a good situation. If you do not have, suppose you have only one type of 
that is a very old tree that means regeneration is not happening that means site quality is not good now so that also we can find out depending upon the growth girth uh, distribution which we have found you can find out the uh, the what kind of distribution is age and class distribution you can uh, use it for very meaningful purpose different models have been proposed you can use any of these model depending upon your uh, uh, i mean your comfort uh, comfort level uh, there are exponential model time power model and the mono molecular model or the well, simple logistic model any of these models you can use it and then you can try to predict the yield uh, available from that particular forest uh, in terms of the growing stock or in terms of the uh, so what basically we are going to do we are we have to make repeated measurement that i said if you have a permanent sample plots laid in that area then you can do it much faster and you can do it much better way of this thing so let us say what are the other uh, factors which are so let us say growth of stand that accumulation of the biomass or increase it in the height are due to photosynthetic activity so this is uh, that means the uh, in spite of all these things the photosynthesis keeps on but lot of removal also takes place in terms of the death of the trees or decay of the trees cutting of the trees or fuel weight extraction and all that so that also has to be accounted for it so for that also different models are here you can consider any of these models uh, where you have the time interval available and then you have the constants available and you can just put in the information and you can get the what will be the growing stock uh, from that yield table and then uh, we have the four parameters here these are the basically which affect that is the stand density canopy density site quality and the yield tables any of these things uh, which uh, which we have affecting the uh, yield can be so stand density means basically the number of relative completeness of trees that means it, it at a certain area if you are expecting 50 trees to grow in 1 hectare and if you get 50 it's excellent if area was suitable for 100 if you get only 50 that means it is under stock so stand density that means number of trees per unit area whatever you, area is given to you if it is good then it is very good because this also is a very important aspect of it then canopy density that is mean completeness of the canopy if it is close canopy the you may have a close canopy but with the only five trees very large crowns or you may have thousand trees very small small thin ones your stem can have the canopy so any of these sections we need to uh work it out in the, from the field we have to find out what is the canopy closure so this also affects the uh, growing condition in that site quality is most important part of it if quality is good then growth will be good quality is rocky this uh, site is called rocky or stoniness is there then rate of this thing is so this formula can be used where you have the different uh, parameters given like uh, you have the climate vegetation this thing and then productivity index which we which can be based on the timing which can be based on the growing time available months available which can be precipitation available and there's a time which you are going to in terms of the temperature we are which you are going to consider so you considering all these thing you can find out what is the area this is then yield tables as i said earlier these are the very useful and they are the tabular statements and they can be for the each site or each district or each forest or each state depending upon the area to area they have been created uh, because they start with the for the site for each site there is a yield table when they can compile it to larger area and then it becomes a, it is generalized in that way okay then uh, estimation of the growth yield there are different uh, contents available in the yield tables like uh, what are the main things given in that average diameter average height total basal area number of tree number of stem form factors so the stem form factor which is very important total stem branch small wood form of form factor standing volume factor standing volume total small wood which is available there or total standing volume any of these things which are available they are given in the and then also it will give the idea about the thinning how much of volume has been thinned can be thinned in the future so all kinds of recommendations are given in that so thinning final yield accumulated yield of thinning so any of these that you have the volume of wood which can be removed in between at certain time of interval 
that's called thinning then you can get final yield and then you can put together you can get the total yield so all these things is possible by using the yield table so you get a total yield in terms of the volume you can also find out the mean annual increment as well as the annual increment because the tables have been prepared using the continuous monitoring of the trees for several years and they know the for this species species in these site conditions this is the increment so that also helps for me to predict the how much of the yield is available to and these are some of the other contents which are available based on the number of the tree or grades in that particular area thinning so you can have a single thinning yield table or you can have multiple yield table depending upon the applications you can have uh, they are all given that then similarly with the volume or the volume uh, they are given there that you can have volume yield tables you can have the monetary yield tables also how much of money you are going to get out of that so that is also given then we come to the modeling part we can correlate the predicted and the estimated so as i said earlier uh, uh, we we have the per plot biomass then we have the per pixel biomass and then we can correlate and then try to have the constant generated we can generate an equation for that particular area like this is this indicates that uh, we have very good correlation of 0.84 r square value between the estimated carbon and all that uh, the I, as i told you earlier from volume we can multiply by specific gravity you get the biomass the biomass half of the biomass that means 0.47 or 47% of the biomass is the carbon so once i know the volume i can multiply by the specific gravity i get the biomass i can take the 47% of the biomass that is the carbon so in a grown stock available volume i can find out how much of the carbon is available for that particular area like this is a, a study which has been carried out in the central india in the gwalior sipuri and sipuri uh, sipuri district it shows how much of the carbon is present in each this is where you can see here in tons per hectare how much of per pixel how much of carbon is available or you can say growing stock and then you can convert into the uh, carbon any of these things are possible provided you have the ground data that is the most important once you have the ground data collected then it is much simply to because we have the constants known we know the equations we know the formula and we can just apply those things on that uh, this is just summary of uh, how the yield table has to be used uh, it is uh, basically that for determination of site quality so if yield is good that you can say okay site quality is very good or yield will be very good similarly for the estimation of total yield or total growing stock estimation of the total yield or growing stock at present age as well as in the future anything of this sort we can do estimation of grow uh, yield and growing stock at uh, future is of a stand which uh, it can be part of it it can be the whole any one of these things you can do simply determination of the increment determination of the rot rotation and similarly preparation of the stock maps because uh, if you know the per, per hectare how much of growing stock is available or volume of wind uh, volume of timber which is available you can uh, update the existing growing stock maps or you can prepare a new one so depending upon that you can uh, any one any one of these you can attempt this is just before i end i just would like to give some hint about that you can there some shortcut methods also like growing stock you can so if you know the forest cover you can multiply by these constants here 1.314 and this thing you can get the growing stock once i know the growing stock i can convert into the biomass so growing stock into 0.41 i can get the biomass this is factor and once i know the biomass then i can take the 0.47% of the biomass is my carbon so any one of these methods i can follow up by future uh, for my growing stock so this was the little quick uh, the growing stock assessment using remote sensing and gis i'm sure you will have lot of questions i will be happy to answer some of these uh, uh, i'll wait for your questions here thank you very much